And now I will ask our old pal Chris Rapley uh, to join us, as well as Svetlana Krakowska. And we're going to talk about tampering with the air conditioner. What will the human impacts be of collapsing ice in the Antarctic? Another big and related discussion here. So here they come. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Svetlana. Chris is a British scientist and administrator who is professor of climate science at University College London. He's chair of the European Science Foundation's European Space Sciences Committee and was director of the Science Museum in London. I know almost everyone has been there. Svetlana. You are a Ukrainian climate scientist and head of the Ukrainian delegation to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. You're an applied climatologist who has introduced climate models to Ukraine. So let's start talking a little bit about Antarctica. You know, the only time I went there uh, was a couple of years ago for a solar eclipse, and this is actually a Milwaukee joke. So yes, it was summertime in the Southern Hemisphere, but I went from Milwaukee to Antarctica, and it was only five degrees Fahrenheit colder in Antarctica than Milwaukee. So, But this is, of course, in all seriousness, a critically important issue when it comes to what's happening to planet Earth. So where do we start with Antarctic ice and what is happening and its crucial importance to what happens overall on the planet? Shall I, shall I start? Um, we've heard quite a lot already about how Antarctica is known to be connected to the rest of the planet and, and to us, uh, but it, it hasn't always been that way. And I was thinking back a um, few years um, asked to help a politician understand where Antarctica was. We spread out a map and showed it down around the South Pole. And he said, oh, that's where it is. Uh, when I was a kid, my globe had the maker's label there. I always wondered if there was something interesting underneath it. And it struck me that actually in the 1950s, he was about the same age as I was, um, the, the makers felt perfectly happy to slap their um, production label on the base and obliterate Antarctica because they didn't think it was very busy. It was a place where heroic deeds were done occasionally, but it was of no great uh, educational value. And, and it reminded me that an atlas that my mother gave me in the 1950s also had a map of the Antarctica, and it said, region largely unknown to man. So since then, with the International Geophysical Year in 57-58, where 67 nations came together to study Antarctica and indeed the whole Earth system, and with the advent of satellites and the base stations that nations have put down there, we've learned that it really is a key component of the, of the world system. And indeed, it plays the role as an air conditioner, because we've heard a lot about the role that the oceans play, the fact that the oceans are warming up, but the really cold, dense bottom water that permeates under the entire world ocean is all generated around the Antarctic. So it connects in a multiple uh, number of ways. OK, so yeah, I can actually con uh, continue a bit maybe about Antarctica, because the, there were a lot of uh, things uh, spoke, spoken today about this. Uh, I uh, was uh, actually one of uh, first women who, uh, Ukrainian women who wintered in Antarctica the whole year. So I spent the, the whole year. In fact, it was a pretty long journey because we spent two months uh, on a vessel to come there and then two months come back. So it was my, uh, I, I would say it's life in, in my life. So because for every day there I can speak almost one day, but I don't have so much time now to speak about this, but this is a beautiful place, uh, which actually changed my mind as well. Uh, so for this, actually, maybe I can speak a bit uh, how I come there uh, and uh, why I'm, I was there. It's just because I, I wanted to study the planet. I was curious and I wanted to travel. I, I didn't uh, even, you know, dream that I will come so 
far, <laughs> let's say. But in my childhood, I started to, to learn uh, um, well, actually, I wanted to, to learn ocean. I, w I wanted to be ocean, ocean, oceanologist or something like this and to study maybe marine biology. But uh, somehow I, I, I actually finished in meteorological faculty. So after all, uh, I believe I, I study ocean, but this ocean, the name of this ocean is atmosphere, and we live at the bottom of this ocean. And I started to study, I guess, the most beautiful thing in this atmospheric ocean is there are clouds. And these clouds actually really, uh, you know, <laughs> not only beautiful, but poetic things. And for me, it was very interesting to study. They, they have very tiny process, processes inside where this magic happened when water comes to ice and then back, and then we have uh, actually rain. Sometimes this rain is good, sometimes uh, it's torrential rain. So I start to make models, actually, of, of these uh, clouds. And uh, I had my actually postdoc in uh, Max Planck Institute uh, of Meteorology in, uh, in, uh, in Germany. And there I discovered climate models. And I was, wow, people can m model climate? How can, can they do it? Because I knew that uh, there are a lot of energy in the system and it's, uh, well, it's uh, difficult. But after all, I discovered, yes, it's possible. Well, you cannot actually uh, predict how, uh, uh, what kind of weather you will have when you will be 50 years old, if you're now 20, let's say. But you can understand what kind of climatic conditions will be at that time and how you how much, let's say, heat waves you will like, experience during uh, your, you know, <laughs> this uh, elder years, let's say. So, with this, uh, uh, I, I should say that there was opportunity for me to come to uh, form a British Antarctic, actually, station, Faraday. So it <laughs> put connection with, with this. And uh, in, when, when I first heard about this, I said, I will be there. So. It it's really was a big uh, opportunity for me, uh, well, to go there. And uh, I was there in the year of the El big, biggest El Nino, 97, 98. And at that time, we didn't have even sea ice. And people were joking, you know, it's climate change. Uh, and I was, hmm. And then I just take uh, this long uh, data records at Faraday Station, which actually started in 1947. And I've got numbers that in this point, uh, temperature rose on 2.5 degrees at that time during 50 years. So the rate was just amazing. It was hot spot in Antarctic Peninsula. And I was just, wow, <laughs> it's indeed climate change. So it actually brings me to, to this Antarctic, and I continue to do this, this job now with my student, and we continue to work actually on polar clouds in Antarctic Peninsula. So with this, uh, I, can, I can say maybe uh, more, because we, we study actually atmospheric rivers in Antarctic as well, and they can bring uh, rain or they can bring actually snow. On, on Antarctic Peninsula, and it really depends on this temperature regime. So will temperature go over zero degree, or it will be less? So in this case, you will gain snow, as it is in East Antarctica, or you will actually have rain on snow, and it will accelerate the process of melting of, of Antarctic shield. So this is my part of my story, I would say, but uh, if you... <laughs> you know, obviously the, oh, sorry. Obviously the, the rate of melting is very alarming of, of ice on the planet and certainly in, our, in Antarctica. We talked a little bit earlier about tipping points and so on. Where are we in the scheme of things as far as um, things that we can actually do to help and reverse very troublesome trends um, or points at which we could reach in which we'd be in deep trouble and, and there's not much we could do but watch the movie unfold. 
Well, Ma Maureen showed us the, uh, the gravity data that shows that the West Antarctic ice sheet is losing ice. We're particularly concerned about that because unlike East Antarctica, where the huge block of ice is sitting mainly on land above, on rock above sea level, much of West Antarctica is sitting on rock well below sea level, even down to two kilometers below sea level. So the ocean hydrostatic pressure is trying to force its way underneath, lubricate the flow and lift the ice. So it's particularly vulnerable and it can add a couple of meters to sea level. Um, and we know from paleo studies that it can do it quite quickly. Um, some of my colleagues think that we've probably gone through that tipping point. Others argue that we're still not quite there, you know, whether it's 1.5, 2 degrees, but we're getting very close. Um, and that's very dramatic because up until now, humanity by and large has had its hand on the thermostat. If we were to take all of the measures that we've been talking about, um, stop pumping or filling the bathtub or pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, uh, manage to pull some back out, then we can have some control over the future of climate. But if the tipping points start to go, then we sit back and simply let physics, chemistry and biology play their role. And uh, we can, we're not entirely spectators. We can have some influence, but we lose the major influence. So we're at a, a very dangerous point. But, but to some extent, as a, as a natural scientist, my, my feeling for, for years now has been we kind of know enough I mean, you know, there's still a huge amount to figure out about the climate system and monitoring it with spacecraft and buoys in the ocean and so on is telling us that the system is changing much more rapidly than we anticipated, which is very worrying. But actually, the problem is really a social one. It's not a scientific one, it's a social one. And it seems to me that Antarctica has a role to play uh, in, in the social world as well in two ways. Firstly, when you go there, and I've been there many times, I was previously director of British Antarctic Survey, and it's an absolutely awe-inspiring place, you know, visually and experientially. But one thing it leaves you with uh, no doubt about is that it's not a place that humans are comfortable in living. There are, there are no permanent residents, and there's a good reason for that. Going to the Antarctic in many ways is like going up to the International Space Station or whatever. There's a huge logistics chain keeping you alive and a large expenditure keeping you alive and sustained so that you can do your work. So that, that experience, the, the kind of overview effect of seeing this magnificent place and realizing that this is not comfortable for humans gives you a respect for the natural world uh, in far larger quantities than the number of people who've been into space. So very large numbers of people go to the Antarctic, very large numbers of people come back with that experience, which is the, the head and the heart the heart is saying, hey, this is actually really quite serious. We need to do something about this. And, and then, of course, we, we can talk about how the political world has dealt with Antarctica. There's much to learn from that. But maybe I'll hold off for that uh, for a second. We'll come back to it. Chris, could you talk a little bit about um, your background and how you got into this complex area of study and some of the earlier work you've done on it? You've done many things. Uh, I, I trained as a physicist, um, a, but very much an experimental physicist, and spent 25 very happy years in a space science lab at University College London building instruments uh, to fly on, on rockets and, uh, and satellites, initially looking out into the cosmos to try and open up new windows. And then I had one of those revelationary experiences in probably about 1980, when a colleague from Stanford showed me some data from CSAT, 1978, first scientific orbiting satellite looking down at the ocean with radars uh, to study the planet, so non-meteorological, actually looking at the ocean. And he said, look, it, it just clips the tip of Greenland and a little bit of Antarctica. He said, these data are going to revolutionize our ability to understand the polar regions because they're, they're very hazardous to get to. They're very expensive to get to. They're dark a lot of the time. You know, the, the number of people crawling around on the surface are sort of just chipping away literally at a tiny piece of the message. Polar orbiting satellites will completely revolutionize this. So that was how, and, and that's what we did. We set up a group to do that work with the European Space Agency and indeed Cryosat, which is flying 
as we speak and mapping the surface of the Greenland ice sheet and so on is uh, one of the outcomes of that. Um, and then there's been another long story since. Uh, going to the Science Museum was interesting because there it's a venue and you have to ask yourself the question, what stories can we tell people about the exhibits that will interest them, engage them, make them feel that they learn something interesting? And so we, we put in a climate science um, uh, uh, gallery with very much with that in mind. And Svetlana, you were going to add something to this yes, direction well, as well, I think. Actually, you know, during this day, I had so many thoughts. I put them in, in the list here, and it's like dots. And I'm really happy that many of my thoughts just resonated with other people, with other speakers here. Uh, well, I, I even don't know <laughs> from which point to start. Uh, okay, social science, of course, it's my feeling as well that we know enough. Mm -hmm. We really know enough to start doing real things on the ground. Okay, maybe not on, only on the ground, but on the earth. So uh, people, I mean humans, they wanted to be king of nature. Okay, to be a king, you need to be responsible for what you own. So we are bad kings, actually, of our own planet. So it, it is my feeling uh, during uh, my, this life, uh, okay, this last uh, decade at least. I didn't say that actually I worked uh, for IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So some uh, pictures he here, uh, we saw it, they are from reports of IPCC. And IPCC, it's uh, very well <laughs> and uh, recognized the uh, uh, UN, United Nations organization, which actually put together all knowledge from prominent science to make it uh, understandable by politicians, <laughs> to, to make them, uh, you know, weaponized to, uh, to actually to act, to act and to tackle this climate change problem. But the problem is that uh, IPCC was actually uh, found in uh, 1988, but we still have politicians discussing, is this climate change real? Come on. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, uh, I, I'd love to, uh, to them to listen to us. And the problem is they don't understand that physical laws, you cannot negotiate physical laws. If degree goes over zero, ice will melt. You cannot, you know, make anything. So uh, there was a question about atmospheric rivers. Well, <laughs> answer was, it's almost impossible. We, we don't have enough energy. And another thing I try to communicate people, because I, I work for communication as well, uh, well, it goes to a very sad part of human history. It goes to Hiroshima bomb. So if we will measure energy goes from the atmosphere to the ocean, with every second, it's six, at least six explosion of such bombs. So this is huge amount. It's unbelievable. It's, un it's you cannot even imagine how much energy now goes to the ocean, and what will happen again? It's an experiment which we are doing with our own home planet. We will not go to Mars. And again, I can speak here as Ukrainian scientists with bombs going on our heads right now during. Today, there was three, at least, air alarm in my home city, Kiev. And it's now every day. And moreover, it exacerbates all what we try to do with climate change. In my previous interviews to journalists, I said that climate change is worse than uh, terrorism. Now, I'm not so much sure. <laughs> because we have terrorist state, which actually can do much bigger, actually, you know, harm to our planet. And I believe the biggest harm to climate change that now we need to put money to weapons to protect ourselves and not to tackle climate change. It's just, you know, I go crazy. In fact, I had one, you know, I, I usually 
uh, I have good imagination, let's say. Before, I, I had such image as we are in one train going to some cliff, and somebody just put coal, you know, in this stuff, I don't know, <laughs> the right word, English word. And people, you know, scientists just go out of window and see this cliff and say, come on, people, stop, put this coal in, in this stuff. But others sit in this car of restaurant, I don't know, it's English word, and they continue to drink and say, life is beautiful, everything is fine. So that was my, uh, you know, picture before. Now I have another picture. So we are in one boat, all nations, but we are heading to waterfall. And now in this boat, actually, instead of rowing to, to the safe place, one big guy starts to beat another. How it could happen? We all go to hell. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is why as somebody trained as a natural scientist, you know, child of the Enlightenment, um, and it goes back to this idea of what's in your head and what's in your heart. And natural scientists are, are taught to try and separate those two things because the heart can upset your ability to be <laughs> in, in, impartial and so on. So you try uh, to, to go through this myth that you are completely, uh, you detach your emotions. I don't know a single scientist that actually does that, but that's a whole other story. Um, but there is the tendency then to believe in the, in the information deficit model, the linear model. We know what's going on. We've been very careful to um, uh, measure, put together a, a, a synthesize a picture. We've been rigorous about it. We're confident. We tell the story and then we expect some magic to happen out there. Uh, we have billions of euros and dollars worth of satellites pumping data down. And, and we natural scientists go, well, why, why isn't the political world reacting? Why aren't people reacting? This is why we need to get into the heads with the social scientists who go, how could you ever have believed that human beings behave that like that? That's not the way human beings make sense of the world. You need to engage them with narrative and you need to give them examples of action. You need to help them find their agency to act. And so if we can just go back to the Antarctic, one of the great success stories is the Antarctic Treaty System. It was established in what, the 1960s and initially 12 nations gave up territorial claims, set aside Antarctica for peace and science. Um, and, and that uh, treaty has um, lasted. There are now, what, 56 nations. Uh, Slovakia is uh, a part of the uh, treaty system. And so it's an example where human beings with a common purpose can overcome their national interests and set them aside and agree to manage a piece of the planet in a way which is conducive to, to peace and the preservation of the environment. And of course, there's an association a treaty for the Southern Ocean fisheries, where that at least it's imperfect, but the Southern Ocean is at least protected in law. Uh, and indeed, quotas are uh, agreed each year uh, in terms of the level of fishing and so on. Now, they may not be properly observed, and that's a whole other story. But it does seem to me that what we're looking for is the nations of the world to stop bickering um, and uh, stop trying to, um, uh, well, to deal with the, the problems of neoliberalism that we, and capitalism, the, uh, the market failures that we heard about earlier, and just have a sensible conversation about we, we are here, we're in the wrong place, we're heading in the wrong direction. How do we figure out how to get ourselves on the right course in the right direction? And you would have thought that people with children and grandchildren would be very content to do that. The Antarctic office, a very nice model. Why on earth can't we get on and do it? If we could at least achieve that, then I think we would be very happy that we're on the beginnings of the right path. Yeah. Very well spoken. Svetlana, do you have any final thoughts? Uh, well, yes. Well, actually, I can continue because, well, I was just scientist, which admire clouds, and then traveling. But then when I recognized the threat, and this threat was for my children. I, I am a mother of four children, actually. So I just start to think what kind of planet they will live in few decades. 
So actually, it's encouraged me to start to speak, to communicate science. So <laughs> I try to, I still learn because I, I help today prominent, <laughs> you know, communicators uh, on, of science. I still learn. Uh, well, it uh, gave me an uh, opportunity, well, to do it not only in Ukraine, but unfortunately of the war of, I had, I had been recognized actually internationally being in top 10 nature people who shape science in 2022. And this was just because I put two dots, it's fossil fuel and the war. So I put together them and they said that fossil fuel war. So if we cut our dependency on this fossil fuel, we will cut, you know, we will be much more secure. And we do it now in Ukraine now, because, well, all our energy system now destroyed. But we have this green energy, which actually works. You know, you can destroy 20% of solar farm, but 80% will still work. You can destroy one uh, windmill, but not all other. So we just, you know, we, we show the world the way how to be more resilient, not only as, you know, in military way, let's say, but in energy way, in security way, and in, in way of uh, loving people, helping each other. And we were so united, especially in the first days. I, I remember it's very clear. No one said that we will withstand three days. It's now third year. But we were so united so we could withstand the enemy. So I believe if we will unite against other crises like climate change, we can do much more. We really powerful, we really can be king of nature, but responsible king and respect nature and not say we and nature and say we are nature. Mm -hmm. It's it just triggered one last thought, and that is um, having sailed across the, the Southern Ocean quite a few times to get to Antarctic bases, you spend days uh, well, sometimes in sea ice, but sometimes just in the ocean. And, um, uh, you know, I find it difficult, you know, the, getting this head and heart thing together, I find it difficult to grieve over the loss of species that have long been extinct. But I remember um, watching an albatross sort of skimming along the Southern Ocean uh, in the, being dragged along by the wind, the draft from the ship, and just watching it. And, and it was so obviously enjoying itself, flying beautifully just a few feet over the ocean waves, and then every so often just tipping its wing into the water. I think a planet in the future that lost that sort of creature would be an absolutely awful legacy for all of us. So if we could unite to preserve nature, as you say, then I think we would do a good job. And we can learn, actually, enjoy this flight, music, poetry, and this <laughs> festival is just about this. Unite, you know, science, art, Humanity. Humanity, yeah. our love. So this, all, all, everything is love. Extremely well spoken by each of you. Thank you so much for joining us. And that concludes our day now, day one hey. of the Starmus Festival. Thank you for coming. We'll see you tomorrow.